Hey, everybody, and welcome to the November issue of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Ashu, and this month we are talking about traumatic hemorrhage. That's right, it's the November article of emergency medicine practice brought to us by doctors Patati and David, who did an outstanding job summarizing everything we need to know regarding traumatic hemorrhage, starting at the very top with principles of identification and pre-hospital care all the way through the ED evaluation and treatment. Now, you may ask yourself why all the attention to traumatic hemorrhage, especially in a country like the United States, and that is because this particular entity remains the leading preventable cause of death in trauma. So this is important, and that's the reason why. Some of you may recall that the lethal triad, as it's been named, in hemorrhagic shock consists of coagulopathy, hypothermia, and acidosis. And so our approach to traumatic hemorrhage includes recognition, damage control, meaning hemorrhage control, appropriate resuscitation, and recognition of coagulopathies. And since all of this begins at the scene of the initial injury, really the authors do an outstanding job of the discussion on tourniquets in pre-hospital care, reminding us that an adequately placed tourniquet is superior to a hemostatic bandage when it can be applied. The correct placement of a tourniquet proximal to the injury, overlying an artery that's amenable to a tourniquet placement, with the appropriate amount of tightness and with loss of distal pulses is really the ideal scenario. And there is a great national campaign called Stop the Bleed that has a poster for non-healthcare trained people to learn how to apply a tourniquet. That's actually included in the article. I encourage you to go look at it view the campaign. There is a link there to get a copy of the poster and to begin educating people in your community on the appropriate placement of the tourniquet. Whenever there's a discussion about tourniquets, people become concerned about prolonged limb ischemia and prefer not to apply them. But it's important to remember that amputation and extremity dysfunction from tourniquet ischemia is actually quite rare when there is definitive care available in less than two hours. But here's the clencher. Some models, according to our authors, tell us that tourniquet application may be required as soon as three to five minutes after the injury before irreversible effects begin to occur. So even though you can tolerate the tourniquet for easily two hours, it's very important that it be placed very, very early and typically by the person right there at the scene witnessing the event. And if you happen to be the person applying the tourniquet, two of the most common pitfalls that our authors point out are failing to recognize that there's a more proximal injury, therefore your tourniquet is actually inadequate, or failing to verify that your distal pulses have actually gone. That means that your tourniquet is tight enough for arterial bleeding to cease and instead losing just venous pulsations, which makes the tourniquet inadequate. Now, for the remainder of pre-hospital care, there are, of course, hemostatic dressings that can make a difference, especially if you have a wound that's not amenable to a tourniquet. Airway interventions are important, but it's also important to remember that positive pressure ventilation can alter a patient's hemodynamics and worsen the shock state. And then when we talk circulation, if your pre-hospital personnel don't have access to blood products, then it's okay to give crystalloid. We just have to remember that they only need enough fluid to maintain maintain and pulses. So we're not looking for normal tension at this point, just normal mentation and pulses to get them to the hospital. Also, there's good evidence that pre-hospital administration of tranexamic acid is beneficial to patients with traumatic shock from the CRASH-2 trial, and that is patients who have an indication within a three-hour window of the initial injury, 
And lastly, temperature management. So making sure your traumatic shock patient does not become hypothermic is critically important during transport. And that means removal of things like wet clothing, adequate warm environment, and making sure that in that transport time, especially if it's a prolonged or helicopter transport time, that somebody is monitoring temperature and keeping the patient adequately warm because they can get cold very quickly. Once the patient arrives in the emergency department, there is activation of the trauma team. And if you're in a small hospital, that's likely just you and your nurses, uh, hopefully more than one nurse. As your team is assembling, making sure you have all the equipment ahead of time is very helpful if you have the benefit of a little extra lead way as they call report before they arrive. And then once they arrive, placing the patient on a monitor and moving rapidly through vital signs becomes very important. There's an excellent discussion in the article about recognition of the hemorrhagic shock state and looking for signs and symptoms of hemorrhage. As the patient continues to lose blood, the authors quickly point out that there are the classic signs of shock, like the patient becoming more anxious, more tachypnic, having cool extremities or pallor, and having a narrow pulse pressure. But things like pulse rate, systolic blood pressure, and respiratory rate don't have the sensitivity that we need to identify all severely injured trauma patients. They may be specific, meaning if there is an elevated pulse rate or a low blood pressure or an increased respiratory rate, your chances of having a severe traumatic injury are higher, but they're not sensitive, meaning that if these things are absent, that does not reliably exclude a severe traumatic injury. There's a great discussion in the article by the authors about calculators for shock and a understanding that the stratification method used by ATLS is actually not necessarily as helpful as one might think. The authors share that over 90% of trauma patients don't match a specific class of shock in the traditional sense that ATLS teaches us, the class 1, class 2, class 3, and class 4 shock going from mild through severe. So they spend some time discussing things like the Delta Shock Index and the Respiratory Adjusted Shock Index as alternative tools that may predict the need for massive transfusion and using that as a surrogate for the traditional traumatic shock illness severity. And so these calculators can be used to determine what the likelihood that your patient you're looking at right now is going to need a massive transfusion. And that can be very helpful if you're working at a small rural center with minimal blood products and a massive transfusion means a immediate transfer. And recognizing that soon allows you some time to begin to make those arrangements while you're completing your assessment of the patient. Okay, so the patient had their injury, has made it through pre-hospital care, is now in our ED, and we've performed some kind of vital sign assessment and initial shock identification, and we're talking about imaging. Of course, when we talk about trauma and traumatic shock, imaging begins with ultrasound and the EFAST, or the extended focused assessment with sonography for trauma. And the EFAST is a bedside ultrasound examination that many of us do routinely on our trauma patients. And we are looking for specific thoracic and abdominal injuries found in a trauma patient. It performs a rapid examination of the lungs, the heart, and the abdominal organs, looking for free fluid, pneumothorax, pericardial fluid, and other injuries that are easily identifiable. The important thing to keep in mind here is that the sensitivity compared to CT can be quite low, but ultrasound does have the benefit of being dynamic. So evaluations of the heart and the inferior vena cava for volume status 
can be real time, can be duplicated again and again and again for repeat assessments, and they're dynamic, meaning they change moment to moment. So can abdominal examinations. So if you have a negative EFAST, that's reassuring, but not all that sensitive, meaning you can't exclude a traumatic injury based on a negative ultrasound, but you can exclude something like a massive hemorrhage going on at this very moment. Uh, repeat exams are important, and imaging with ultrasound and then CT is, of course, very, very helpful. Depending on your facility, your local protocols, your trauma surgery colleagues, there may be times when someone who is hypotensive makes it to CT. This is not ideal, but sometimes that kind of imaging is necessary for preoperative planning. That's certainly not done routinely. It's not done without hesitation, and it's not done without a lot of support. So if you're that lone person working out there in a lone hospital, you're looking at resuscitation and transfer. You're certainly not going to waste time obtaining imaging and certainly not going to image someone who's critically unstable. The bulk of your efforts efforts are at resuscitation and transfer. And then, of course, there are the labs. Now, if you have a trauma protocol already in place, you're going to order that and move on, and you may not be thinking about exactly what labs that includes. But helpful measurements include things like serum lactate and base deficit, which have been shown to predict resuscitation requirements and mortality more accurately than things like classic shock classification. But they are only a snapshot in time. That's the time that you drew the lab. More recently has been the development of techniques like viscoelastic clot testing. And these are things like thromboelastography or rotational thromboelastography, the RTEG or the ROTEM, as they are uh, abbreviated. But if you've never seen one of these, these are fascinating little tests. They're meant to employ mechanical means to measure the speed and the strength of clot formation, and they can spit out a result sooner than conventional coags come back from the lab. And they've been recognized by several trauma organizations like the American College of Surgeons, the European Trauma Guidelines, the United States Military Damage Control Resuscitation Guidelines, and others as an important test that shows utility when trying to determine the appropriate resuscitation of a patient with traumatic shock. Now, all these patients are at risk for developing acute traumatic coagulopathy, and that's defined as a prolongation of your PT INR beyond 1.5. But the viscoelastic thromboelastography uh, can actually tell the physician or the people caring for the patient at the bedside of the specific deficiency in clot formation and lysis which in theory then is going to allow us to tailor the resuscitation with the correct component and improve outcomes. So we're talking about things other than just throwing a bunch of whole blood or a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio of red blood cells, platelets, and plasma but instead doing a tailored approach, administering to the patient what they actually need to improve their coagulation. So, for example, the article mentions one study that involved about 111 trauma patients with significant injuries who received a TAG, one of these thromboelastograms, and were found to have a hyperfibrinolysis state. Now, this is a state that occurs in up to 34% or so of trauma patients and can be lethal. It's treated with tranexamic acid, but in this particular trial, the patients who received the thromboelastography actually had fewer blood components used and spent less time in the ICU with improved 28-day mortality and they had higher survivability rates at six hours, at which time the conventional group had actually received more plasma and more platelets. And so this kind of testing or the rationale behind this kind of testing is to try and determine where the deficiency is and to tailor the approach to that deficiency instead of providing all of the products all of the time to all of the patients.
If you're unfamiliar with the test or what the result looks like, there's an outstanding figure in the article, that's figure three on page seven, which shows you some examples of what the actual formation looks like coming out of the machine and how that correlates to different coagulopathic disease states that would then require specific treatments. It's a fantastic visual, and I highly recommend looking at that when you have a moment. The authors do spend some time discussing the damage control resuscitation approach to a trauma patient, and the distinction between that and the standard ATLS approach to a trauma patient meaning that the damage control resuscitation approach looks first to try and quell the source of traumatic hemorrhage and begin resuscitation in order to optimize things like endotracheal intubation and other interventions that need to be performed. So in a damage control scenario, you may find yourself delaying necessary things like endotracheal intubation because of the adverse effects it's going to have on hemodynamics and instead moving forward with resuscitation first while just assisting ventilations. So that's the mindset comparing those two approaches. When you're in that kind of mindset, there is the option to utilize things like hemorrhage control devices. Now, the authors fully acknowledge that most of these are not available outside of a tactical setting. So if you're not in one of those settings, you don't have to spend a lot of time looking through these. There are certainly a lot of devices that are available now, even commercial devices for things like occluding hemorrhage even at junctional sites. So that's areas uh, between the abdomen and an extremity where you can't apply a standard tourniquet and there may be benefits to some of those devices, but there is a really good discussion of Reboa or resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. If you've never heard of this procedure before, it is intended to mimic the surgical cross clamping of the abdominal aorta, except by placing a catheter into the abdominal aorta from below. So it requires access to the arterial circulation from the lower extremities up into the abdominal aorta with the inflation of a balloon. There are a couple of small studies that have shown some benefit to using one of these devices, but it's important to recognize that this is not something you're doing without support in a rural hospital. This is something you're doing with your operative staff nearby and with the intent to take the patient to the operating room in less than 15 minutes. It's not meant to be placed for prolonged transport or for hemorrhage control on the way to definitive care. It really is an immediate temporizing measure on the way to the OR. And it's done with massive education for emergency physicians and trauma physicians and the entire staff because it's not just as simple as placing a central line. There certainly is an educational process to putting this in and to performing this procedure, but it isn't outside of the scope of our training. Both the American College of Surgeons and the American College of Emergency Physicians have a joint statement about the use and correct identification of patients and who can place these catheters. But the most important thing to remember is it's not done in isolation. It's always done with your trauma team at the bedside and with the intent to move rapidly to the operating room. And if you're not in that kind of scenario, this is really not the right device to be reaching for. There is a good discussion in the article about CPR and the fact that if a patient is requiring CPR, that their mortality is extremely high and that procedural intervention should be aimed at determining the life-threatening cause that has caused the pulseless arrest. Otherwise, that patient is not going to recover. There's also an excellent discussion of resuscitative thoracotomy. Again, this is a procedure where the chest is actually opened and open cardiac massage is performed. And again, the authors are quick to acknowledge even the West Trauma Association guidelines, which specify that 
if you have acceptable CPR for 15 minutes or less in penetrating trauma or 10 minutes or less with blunt trauma, uh, that that is the time frame in which you could adequately perform a resuscitative thoracotomy and expect that you might have some kind of mortality benefit, but that this is done with the appropriate surgeon standing there with you. Again, if you're working in a rural setting or in a hospital where you don't have a trauma team and somebody ready to take this patient to the operating room now, a resuscitative thoracotomy is not an appropriate procedure. Because even if you open the chest and identify a surgically repairable wound and you manage to temporize it with something very small and quick, it's not going to last long enough to transfer that patient somewhere to get definitive care. This has to be done with the appropriate surgeon and surgical staff and OR ready to go. And so we move on to airway. And of course, no conversation regarding airway and a trauma patient would be complete if we didn't have to delve into succinylcholine versus rocuronium. Yes, there has been a decades-long discussion about the most appropriate paralytic to use in a trauma patient or even in a medical patient for that matter, but the authors, I think, do a good job summarizing some of the contraindications for the use of succinylcholine. These are relative contraindications, and some of the more recent studies that have perhaps shown a benefit to using medications like rocuronium. And again, if you're in one shop and you only have access to one of these, this is a moot argument. You don't need to go and beat your fists against the door and demand that you have access to rocuronium if your hospital just has it nowhere. But if you have the option to pick between the two, then the authors have provided here a nice review of the pros and cons of either one of these approaches. The biggest thing to keep in mind here is that intubating a patient is going to result in hypotension more often. So making sure that the patient is appropriately resuscitated or at least in the process of being appropriately resuscitated is important. And anticipating that post-procedural hypotension can go a long way in making sure you have the right adjuncts at the bedside to intervene immediately after you've just intubated this patient. The breathing exam is focused at identifying things like tension pneumothorax or hemothorax, and then addressing issues related around intubation and ventilation, things like mechanical ventilation and making sure that they have appropriate air movement and that they're maintaining normoxia, that is that they're not getting too much oxygen as that's been shown to be detrimental to patients. And then we land on circulation. And this is where the part of the discussion turns towards things like fluid resuscitation and massive transfusion. Now, when we talk about massive transfusion, the authors have already spent some time looking at calculators that can help us predict which patients might need it. But in this section, they spend a little time defining it. Massive transfusion can mean different things to different people, and so some of the previously provided definitions in the medical literature include things like transfusion of more than 10 units of packed red blood cells in 24 hours. That's actually the American College of Surgeons definition. Or replacement of a patient's entire blood volume in 24 hours. Another definition is transfusion of more than four units in one hour. And yet another definition includes replacement of 50% of the total blood volume in three hours. Regardless of which definition you choose, you need to know when to implement the protocol. And that can be driven by guidelines. And there are two sets that are discussed in the article. The first comes to us from the American College of Surgeons, and this defines several criteria, only one of which is necessary to initiate a massive transfusion protocol. This includes four criteria, the first of which is an ABC score greater than or equal to two. So ABC is the assessment of blood consumption and is one of the multiple calculators discussed in the article. Second, persistent hemodynamic instability. Third, active bleeding requiring operation or angioembolization. And lastly, fourth, blood transfusion in the trauma bay. Those are the four criteria given to us by the American College of Surgeons for when a patient might need a massive transfusion. 
The alternate guidelines that the authors discuss come to us from the military, and the military recognizes several other factors that can be predictive of the need for massive transfusion or just aggressive resuscitation. Things like injury patterns, for example, above-the-knee amputation, multiple amputations, or clinically obvious penetrating injury to the torso. Second, vital sign abnormalities, like systolic blood pressure less than 110 or heart rate greater than 100. Third, greater than two regions that are positive on the FAST examination. And lastly, laboratory findings, things like a pH less than 7.25, a hematocrit less than 32%, a lactic acid greater than 2.5, an INR greater than or equal to 1.2, or a base deficit greater than 6. So in addition to the criteria given to us by the American College of Surgeons, the military has added these additional criteria as a guideline for patients who might require the use of massive transfusion protocols. And again, regardless of the definition or the specific guideline you use, understand that once you initiate a massive transfusion protocol, there is a previously prescribed method for deciding when to give things like packed red blood cells and plasma and platelets. And that can be based either on a thromboelastogram or a predefined ratio, like for example, one to one to one, where a unit of packed red blood cells is given, then a pack of platelets, then some fresh frozen plasma, and then back to a unit of blood again, or a one to one ratio of just red blood cells and plasma and no use of platelets unless their platelet count happens to be less than say 100,000. There are multiple different examples of massive transfusion protocols out there, but regardless, once it's initiated based on a predefined recognition of an unstable trauma patient, the patients actually do better. Evidence tells us that patients with massive transfusion protocols have reduced mortality, improved outcomes, and believe it or not, actually consume less blood products by the time it's all said and done. There's a great discussion of all of this in the article, and again, even if you work at a small rural hospital where you have minimal access to blood products, if you're caught in a scenario where you're trying to decide how much blood to give, whether or not to accompany it by plasma or platelets, if you have the option to give those, this is a good time to define your own institutional massive transfusion protocol that can be used and initiated even before a patient is being transferred or continued while they're in transport to the local trauma center. If you don't have blood products, there is crystalloid, but the authors are quick to remind us of all the negative effects of large quantities of crystalloid administration. Things like worsening third spacing, uh, increasing the chances of compartment syndrome, electrolyte derangements, acidosis, all of these problems accompany large volume initiation of just IV crystalloid without blood products. So though they're readily available to us, at some point you're going to have to give something else. And if you don't have that, actually judicious use of crystalloid, meaning giving less than you would normally do, allowing someone to be hypotensive for a short while, but maintaining their mentation and their peripheral pulses is ideal in this scenario. So just enough to maintain perfusion, but not enough to make them normotensive. The goal isn't to fill the tank with crystalloid as much as it is to just keep fuel running through the system until you can get them somewhere where the traumatic hemorrhage can be contained. I highly encourage you to go and read the issue and spend some time reading the descriptions and the background, the painstaking detail that the authors have placed into each one of the different items that can be given to support circulation. Whole blood, packed red blood cells, plasma, platelets, ratios of blood products, and their definition and recommendations for permissive hypotension in the acute traumatic coagulopathic patient. And as if that wasn't enough, the authors actually devote an entire section to specialty drugs, things like tranexamic acid, 
prothrombin complex concentrate or PCC or four-factor PCC. That's the medication used in order to rapidly reverse things like warfarin and cryoprecipitate and fibrinogen, which can be guided by things like viscoelastic clot testing. Okay, stay with me. Two caveats that the authors include here under special circumstances and populations. One is patients with CNS injury. So these patients are known to have worse outcomes with things like permissive hypotension. So this would be an exception to the rule where resuscitating to a normal or the upper end of normal mean arterial pressure is important to maintain perfusion to the brain. Second is pediatric patients. These patients have been shown to have the same adverse outcomes from large volumes of crystalloid infusions and also to have the same benefit from blood product transfusion. They also have been shown to benefit from things like viscoelastic clot testing, but permissive hypotension specifically in pediatric patients has actually not been studied. So still a little question mark there uh, about whether or not that's beneficial in children. And that's it for the article. It really is jam-packed with information regarding patients who are suffering from traumatic hemorrhage. And I think the key takeaways here from this article are the broad guidelines, things like definitive hemostasis, application of a tourniquet and hemorrhage control early on is critically important. The principle of permissive hypotension utilized in patients until hemostasis is achieved and then normalization of perfusion becomes the new goal after hemostasis is achieved. Assessing adequate resuscitation requires continuous vital sign measurement and urine output monitoring as well as evaluation for rebleeding. And the early recognition of patients who are going to require massive transfusion and the early initiation of that protocol is greatly beneficial. If you have type-specific blood, that is the best. If you don't, it is perfectly safe and appropriate to use O-negative for females and O-positive blood for males without worrying about RH antibodies and severe transfusion reactions. Well, folks, that's it for this month's episode of Amplify. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to the program. If you haven't been to ebmedicine.net recently, I can't encourage you enough to go visit today. Have you seen the article on pediatric head and neck infections? Have you seen the Rich Levitan video on placement of the supraglottic airway? Have you perused the three-course program on strokes and the accompanying video on life-threatening headaches? There is so much content at that website ready for you to just dive into. It is an incredible amount of information and there just can't be enough said about the library of content at your fingertips, ebmedicine.net. Go there today. Until next time, I'm your host, Sam Shu. Stay safe. <laughs>